Good evening. Uh, welcome to the special meeting of the City Council's hearing uh, to address the administrative orders presented by the mayor and proposed by the mayor. And it's a public hearing. Uh, this is October 28th, 2018, uh, 2014, although it says 2018 on the agenda, so we are lashing ahead to the future. <laughs> Uh, I'm City Council President Bill Dwight. I'll be presiding. This is the purpose of this hearing is informational. We will not be deliberating. There will be no vote associated with the hearing tonight. Uh, we are in the process of trying to uh, get as informed as we can about um, the significant change that's occurring at, as mandated by the Charter. The Mayor was obliged to literally present us with an omnibus uh, holistic change in he, the administrative structure as and as I said that was mandated by the Charter and so it's not likely we'll ever experience something on this magnitude again the mayor can at uh, his or her discretion come before the council and make a presentation for uh, possible changes ongoing as they arise but this is the only time that we'll be talking about virtually every uh, department agency that comes under the aegis of the mayor's uh, and the executive office. So um, the format is um, you have an opportunity to sign up if you're interested in speaking. You're not obliged to because, of course, we, if, as I said to some folks before, if the spirit moves you, you're certainly welcome to stand up and testify. But when you do, please come to the microphone, uh, state your name and address for, for the purposes of uh, the public record this is um, being recorded and will qualify as a public record of these hearings and I will ask of uh, the secretary to call the roll please. Councilor Adams here Councilor Carney Councilor Dwight here Councilor Klein present Councilor Labarge present Councilor O'Donnell here Councilor Shera here Councilor Spector here Councilor Murphy <coughs> uh, has been excused uh, with prior notification and Councilor Carney has also uh, notified me that she will be showing up a little late but she will be here um, I would ask someone to uh, move that we open the hearing second any discussion on that all those in favor please aye. say aye aye, aye. 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 We, have form, we have convened um, do you have the sign-up sheet for the this <laughs> This is different than the council chambers. This is this involves hikes, <laughs> vast distances to navigate. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. So first up, uh, Susan Ford, please. And and Susan, before you speak, I should also say that, unlike a council meeting, this is you have an opportunity. You're not limited by the time, and you have the opportunity to ask questions or the counselors in turn have uh, are allowed to ask or discuss points made as well it's not required but I'm just saying that it's it's a lot different format if you're used to the public comment section in the, in the city council so the floor is yours I adjusted my mic which brings to mind one of my frustrations in watching it on TV is so often can't hear it because you're either leaning back or the mic is off to the side. So I hope you can hear me. Can hear you fine, yes. Okay. I'm Susan Ford and I live on Spring Street in Florence. And I was a member of the Northampton Tree Committee for six years and a chair for one of those. Um, and I am here to discuss the issue of the committee and the tree warden that the mayor put into his proposal. I do applaud the mayor for increasing the budget for the tree program in the city, a much needed increase. I believe that significant planning, however, is required for um, long-term as well as short-term planning for the use of that money. It, it, it's very tempting to say, wow, we've got all this money, let's go out and plant a lot of trees. But trees grow slowly and um, some in some places better than others and it's important to plan <coughs> what we're going to do in Northampton um, five years from now ten years what do we hope our tree canopy will be like 
I'm also very interested in the tree warden proposal, and I would hope that this would be a designated, if that's the correct word, position. Someone whose responsibilities would not be just added on to a job that already exists in the DPW. It seems from my experience on the tree committee that um, those folks have quite enough to do already. And my concern would be that the tree warden responsibilities would not then be a priority, that they would get pushed aside and not always tended to. I hope that the new committee, when it's formulated, will be able to work effectively with the DPW um, and closely, very closely, with the tree warden. There are so many opportunities out there for outreach, for grant writing, um, educational opportunities, um, community involvement. It really, um, I think it's a very exciting um, thing to have an actively involved tree committee. Um, and this would be, I believe, of great benefit to the city, um, short term <coughs> and long term. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should also note that the mayor is present. Uh, this, this is his presentation. If, if there are any questions um, that you have relative to this issue, please direct them to me, and the, we'll, the mayor will have an opportunity to respond. Um, next up, we have Emery Ford. No relation. <coughs> My name is Emery Ford. I live at 364 Spring Street in Florence. I'm here as an interested uh, resident and taxpayer. I am not a member of any committee in the town. I don't represent the Chamber of Commerce or any committee on the Chamber of Commerce, BID, nor any other function. And I wanted to say that because I've recently had a rather bad experience when I chaired a committee and I had people on the committee who did not fully disclose uh, what their interests were at the time. Well, I would suggest to the counselors that they ask people who speak to fully disclose who they are, what committees they represent, and what functions they may belong to in or out of the government, because it might or might not have a bearing on what they say. My first comment is the mayor did as the charter called for. I've heard complaints that the mayor did not reach out to council members. I would like to remind the council it was not a secret that the mayor was working on the reorganization. The charter revision called for it. The council and its members had an opportunity to reach out to the mayor with ideas at any time. I have read the mayor's reorganization plan, some 70 odd pages. While there are things I would do differently, on balance it streamlines the government and ensures a clearer separation of the powers between the council and the executive branch. In particular, <coughs> I support having the DPW report directly to the mayor. It eliminates the problem of an unelected board, the appointed public works board, having the power to assess fees and charges without citizens controlling the board through elections. Some have suggested the board, the DPW board, has functioned and served well. Whether or not you agree with that, the issue is having an unelected board with the power to assess the city resident a tax or a fee. That is a fundamental issue of taxation without representation. That issue was resolved in 1776 with the Revolutionary War. This country decided at that time we were going to not have taxation without representation. I recommend the council vote yes on the mayor's proposal. I am sure changes will be required with time. Now is the time to get started. We voted yes on the charter. The charter provided for the reorganization. The time has come to get on with it. 
Thank you. <coughs> uh, next up, we have the president of uh, Local 105, Matt Lemberg. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me to come here and speak on this tonight. My name is Matt Lemberg, 24 Lockhouse Road, Westfield, Mass. I represent the International Association of Firefighters, Local 108, Northampton Firefighters Chapter. Uh, speak to you tonight, again, against the proposed changes to the city charter. Uh, as part of these proposed changes, the fire department will change its name to the Fire and Rescue Department. Uh, as a local, many of my members have come to me with concerns about this name change. By changing the name of the fire department, it's actually suggested that we are two different, fire, two different departments. We are a fire department that runs an ambulance service and have been doing so successfully for many years. What we are not is separate fire and rescue departments, as the name change would suggest. For 157 years, we've been the Northampton Fire Department. Why all of a sudden does this need to change? The change will also cost money. I'm aware that Chief Duggan sent a memo saying that this would slowly be phased in. To us, that's unacceptable. We pride ourselves on our professionalism and appearance as a part of this. We cannot accept that some members would be wearing Northampton Fire Department apparel, and if this passes, some will be wearing Northampton Fire Rescue Department apparel. We take pride in our appearance and are proud to be members of the Northampton Fire Department. The costs associated with this name change also need to be considered. Putting the average cost of uniform change at $300 per person, that's badges, t-shirts, uniform shirts, turnout gear, uh, and the like. The, the total cost for just uniform for 68 personnel would be upwards of $21,000. Add to that the cost of relettering apparatus, stations, the floor patch at the now infamous station floor redoing project, and assorted paper goods, the total bill would approach $40,000. Does the city have the extra funds for this? Because I will instruct my firefighters not to utilize their clothing allowance for something that was changed without any input from the labor side of the fire department. And this brings up my biggest concern, and that's the lack of communication that this name change was being considered. Our members learned about this proposal from the Daily Hampshire Gazette. The name change was proposed to the members some time ago, approximately 12 to 13 years ago, and it was resoundingly defeated at that time. Not once this time were we asked our opinion. You as counselors represent the city of Northampton. How would you feel if the name was changed to something none of you respected or had any input on? Another aspect of the lack of communication between parties is the failure of the powers that be to research past or current contracts. In Article 1 of our Collective Bargaining Agreement, Section 1.01, .01, it states that, I quote, the city hereby recognizes the union as the sole exclusive representative and bargaining agent for all full-time uniformed and investigatory employees of the Northampton Fire Department, et cetera, et cetera. The fire department is referenced throughout the collective bargain agreement, and any changes to that agreement must be bargained. Again, we were not even asked our opinion. The change will do two things in the locals' opinion. It will cost money, and it will hurt morale. We work for the Northampton Fire Department. We're proud to be Northampton Fire Department members. Changing our name without asking our opinion is simply not a clerical change. It's a morale killer, as we had no say in this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions, uh, Councilor Spector? Can I ask the mayor a question now? Um, would you sure. Prefer you can direct me. Yeah. Mayor, could I ask you a question to clarify again? What, why are you proposing this change, though? Sure. You do it at the podium, though. Thanks. Again, as we went through the um, as we went through all of the city departments, we were trying to make sure that the uh, that the names of our city departments reflected the the current mission of them. Uh, and as some of you may know, we went through a transition a couple of uh, years ago uh, where we fully integrated uh, EMS into the department. And then last year, in our budget process, uh, you, if you look at the F FY15 budget, um, we tried to further integrate it into the name by using this term fire rescue department which uh, and again we're not saying fire and rescue department but fire rescue department so I don't, I'm not sure that that implies that there's two separate departments um, you did receive a memo from the chief which really outlines uh, 
the, 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 the really changed mission. And I think that's why departments around the country have recognized this change. Um, there's a, uh, a recent article, I think it was in the Los Angeles Times, about the um, Los Angeles Fire Department um, and the fact that they, um, they just had a major study done. And one of the recommendations was changing the name of the department to, to reflect. And in fact, the name they suggested was Fire Rescue. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, about 20% of the calls that the department receives are for fire, for fire suppression. And obviously, there's a number of other calls that, that are now being responded to. So in part, it's a way to um, let the public understand the mission um, as, well as, uh, as well as accurately re reflect it. So that's the, that's the basis. You do have the memo from the chief about the, um, about the cost issue. Uh, and again, I, 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 I guess I feel like this is one of those issues within the charter as part of the, uh, you know, my purview as the chief executive officer uh, to be able to look at the departments and to make decisions about, uh, about how, uh, how to accurately reflect them. Councilor Spector, you saw that. I mean, I do understand the rationale, but I think, <clears throat> can you understand what the pushback both from the union and the cost that, you know, when you weigh those two things, yeah, I guess the question um, becomes uh, if we are, uh, we're, we're not planning a wholesale re-lettering, rebranding of the entire department. I think that's what we're saying is that over time that's something we can do. Uh, we we, we uh, replace turnout gear um, uh, over time when it reaches its expiration date. Um, and so that, for example, is an opportunity that, uh, that turnout gear could be replaced. Um, patches and things like that uh, could be could be updated over time, um, but certainly was not uh, not an effort. That, there's no intention on, on our part to make this a overnight. Everything will be rebranded, um, just like there wasn't when we uh, changed the department to you know EMS to be full time EMS, and just like when the budget you adopted for this fiscal year described the department as the fire rescue department. So, uh, Council of the Bars, then Council of Klein, then Council of Sharon, and Council of Adams. I'm hearing um, from the union president in regards to the communication part of it. Now, are, were these meetings just held with the department heads? You were the department heads? <coughs> In terms of when we had discussions with various departments, about changing the we names. definitely spoke with department heads about it, and um, I can't speak to what internal discussions went on. Uh, it sounds like this uh, was an issue that had been broached a few years ago, yes. um, but um, but in terms of my process, uh, uh, no, I was meeting with department heads and uh, and also again trying to make it reflect what's in our budget book. Um, so it's yeah. Councilor Klein. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the Firefighters Union for bringing this to our attention and for caring enough about uh, the city budget to, to bring up that issue. Um, and I just want to check with you, Mayor. I heard Mr. Lemberg say that there was an issue that the union is the body with which you need to negotiate any changes. And I want to know if you've checked with the city solicitor, if you have a sense of whether or not there could be, in fact, a legal issue here that the union wasn't consulted directly um, by the city, not just by the chief and others, other powers that be within the fire department, and if we could, in fact, um, be, uh, be responsible for a need to be responsible as a city for, in fact, checking with the union. What yeah, I, I, I haven't. Uh, the, this particular issue that was raised tonight about the reference to the name of the city department uh, in in the contract, um, haven't. That's that's an interesting ish question. Um, I would frankly be surprised since it has nothing to do with working conditions. It has nothing to do with any of the any of the terms of the contract. But that's certainly something I can check into between now and uh, November sixth uh, in that. terms of that particular name. Um, Councilor Shara and then Councilor Adams. Am I able to ask uh, Mr. Lindberg a question? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> You. Um, obviously, there, you've expressed strong feelings about this. Um, could you I explain a little bit more 
other than the, the cost issues and you, some morale issues that you've talked about, <coughs> you used strong language saying that it was a name you didn't respect. Could you explain more what, what about the name this, the, the, the addition of the rescue, in, in our opinion, the addition of the fire rescue instead of Northampton Fire Department. When I took the oath 13 years ago, Northampton Fire Department, everybody before me, Northampton Fire Department, up till last week when we swore in four or five new members. Uh, that's who we represent. That's the body that we serve. We serve the citizens of Northampton, obviously, first and foremost. But we are members of the Northampton Fire Department. If someone has a problem, if there's a rescue that needs to be facilitated in Northampton. If there's a fire or a car accident or or a fire alarm, so they call the fire department. They don't need to call a fire rescue. We don't need to explain that. If you ask any Joe citizen who they call if they have an issue, it's the fire department. Um, the change would would almost be, and in our opinion, is you're taking a name that we've all proudly served, that we all respect. We serve the Northampton Fire Department and you're changing it without our input. You've, you've basically changed our name and the fire rescue aspect of it is a west coast phenomenon. It's been going on for years on the left coast, California, Oregon, Washington, and it's slowly working its way across the country. It hasn't gotten into this real strong eastern bastion of tradition yet. Um, but when it comes down to it, if you ask the guys and girls or the members I work with, we work for the fire department. We had a it's always been the fire department. Tradition has dictated it's the fire department. This fire rescue to us is something that none of us are behind because none of us were consulted on it. Thank you. Council Mayor, um, about the dispute about the cost, uh, if you, so Chief Duggan believes there will be no, there will be no cost ramification at all. And, and no, I think what he was referring to in his memo that the change was not going to his plan was not to rebrand everything immediately, but that as apparatus was changed or as a new apparatus came online, that would be an op opportunity to do it. Um, so that was the, the question. I do have to correct the record. Um, the members of Local 108 work for the city of Northampton, actually. Um, they don't work for the fire. They work for the city of Northampton. That's what's printed on their paycheck. Um, and so that's, I think I have to make that clear. Like all city employees, they work for the city of Northampton and they take an oath to uphold the laws and the ordinances <coughs> of the city of Northampton. So, uh, um, so that's, a, that's a key distinction, I think. <coughs> Let's go continue. But with respect to the $40,000 that Mr. Lemberg cited, um, and so there's, this, there's, there's a dispute about what it will cost. Um, and you're saying there'll be none to the city, but but do you do you agree that there will be that cost borne by the members? There, uh, I think what he was referring to is that when um, members uh, use their clothing allowance to go buy um, equipment or to have bought purchase new shirts, there was a question about um, not liking the branding. I think that's what he was referring to. Um, we certainly don't make members by the, the, the branding aspect of it, but certainly they have an allowance for boots and for other equipment that they receive a, a financial assess, up to a certain amount that they get reimbursed when they purchase equipment. Um, so what we're talking about here, though, would be uh, a patch at some, you know, if, if a new patch was implemented, it would, uh, it would be sewn. You may remember, for example, um, recently the police department came forward um, and made a request to this council uh, that they wanted to make some changes to their dress uniforms and they wanted to do um, have some additional uh, changes to the patch and some changes to the striping um, and requested a uh, actually allow re requested the council's authorization to use some excess funding in their budget um, I think it was on the order of 12,000 plus I'd have to recheck um, to, to make those changes and you authorize them. So again, I, I think this is something we're talking about over time uh, and I don't believe it would be an additional cost to the members. Um. Uh, you all set? Thank you. Uh, Council of Barnes. Mayor, are there any other cities locally that have changed their names to fire rescue? There's about 14 or 15 in Massachusetts now. Um, uh, and it isn't just a West Coast. I mean, Miami Fire Department, which is one of the oldest 
in the country. They've changed to fire rescue. Again, I, I actually, interestingly, um, one of the debates that's been going on is the fact that and, um, because we have all this new technology, because we have sprinkler systems, because we have better building codes, we have seen less fires. And, and so in some ways, um, this has come from, uh, you know, within fire community of folks trying to make sure that people understand that we're not just, this isn't just about fires, we're doing EMS, we're doing rescue, uh, we're doing, uh, you know, our, our, our folks um, do water rescue and train for water rescue on the Connecticut River. Uh, they do a lot more than just the traditional uh, things that people think about of a, of a fire department. So that's why this is sort of a nod to the fact that the job, the mission of of the of fire departments have changed, um, and that's what we're funding. Um, I have a question of President Lemberg. And by the way, I realize I misidentified your local when I introduced you. That's okay. It, well, I imagine your your rank and file probably wouldn't be to keen on that. I'll, I'll calm him down. <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, my takeaway is I hear from you principally the strongest <laughs> emphasis about the concern is the lack of consultation and discussion with 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 your people um, because you know the old adage arose by any other name but the it, the mayor actually brings up a point that in the course of public safety meetings that I've attended is true that the culture of of fire suppression has transitioned more to fire prevention and rescue services, the panoply of rescue services that you uh, rightfully brag about, which, sure. um, and it would seem to me that your membership would probably, if we assume that there are consultations <laughs> taking place, that would li like to be identified for the panoply of services that they offer. I mean, I think, to your point, I think one of the things that I found is that people have these kind of age-old mindset about what firefighters are. Most, you know, six-year-old boys and girls want to grow up to be firefighters. But that's going in with an ax and an air tank and going in and, and banging out a fire. And when point in fact, you guys are, you're doing everything from baby seats to fitting, fitting up car seats to rescues to the ambulance service, <coughs> emergency transport, first responder stuff, and and I think <coughs> their first call is 911, not necessarily the fire department, which dispatch sends. But they 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 think it goes to this massive network of various people with a with a singular skill set. Point in fact, that is your department skill set that is that by my reckoning actually is underappreciated. So if the consultation point, I think, is the most salient point. And am, am I right in assessing that? Is I'd say that, that was, that's, that's accurate. Uh, the, the fact that we were left out of the loop and that we found out from the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Right. The, no, the morning you guys are going to talk about it. So we had no chance to get anything ready to even discuss it. Um, and then I sat back and, and talked with my executive board and we came up with the letter I emailed to everybody. Uh, and. and Councilor, you are correct. We, we, our, our area of, of expertise has expanded tenfold since the 1970s when America Burning came out and fires were, were everything going on. Um, but it, it comes back to communication. You know, we were not, it'd be like, you know, changing your name without anybody telling you. And, and it, it was, it was off-putting. Well, that's what I hear. And that's, that's, and that, that is of concern. And um, so, but I wanted to make sure that the, the morale issue had more to do with less to do so much with the title, but the fact that there was no consultation and that uh, there were a lot of presumptions made without the rank and file being able to weigh in. That's accurate. Yes. Uh, beyond that, though, the name in and of itself is, is a, at least by my, from where I'm looking, is a greater and more comprehensive a descriptor of, of what it is you guys do. We come to work and, and obviously it's a different day. Everything's going to be different. No two days are the same. They're none are alike. And, and we don't claim that they're going to be. We don't claim that we come to work and do the same thing over and over. 
um, we have increased our services with EMS, with water rescue, with we have members on the technical rescue team for high angle rescue, low angle rescue, trench rescue, things like that. Um, so we do rescue, but if you call 911 looking for rescue from something, they know to send the fire department. If you, like I said, if you ask anyone, send the fire department. Okay, I always tell people, I make a joke. If you look on the phone book and you can't figure out who to help with your problem, call the fire department because they'll come out and figure something out for you. And, and Mayor, I do apologize. We all do work for the city of Northampton, so I misspoke there before. Um, I understand that. Uh, but the, the fact is this change, like you said, was done or proposed, and nobody asked us. And the other thing that I took away from this was the rather proud sense of tradition and that uh, not being consulted when changing a, a dimension of that tradition um, pro clearly stung. And, I, and that's my takeaway from this, but as, as, as I'm trying to figure out what's the most appropriate way to proceed, I think this is an interdepartmental issue that requires perhaps some uh, consultation uh, to make sure that the lines of communication are clearer. But I, I just wanted to make sure that there was actually no stigma necessarily attached to the change. There's not, and we recognize there's there's large departments that have gone to fire rescue because I mean he the mayor referenced Miami. They have a, a venom unit. They do snake bites and scorpion stings. Okay, they they have specialized rescue teams down there, and they're gigantic. They have. 3,000 firefighters covering that area. We have 68 firefighters covering Northampton, and again, you ask anybody in Northampton, we're the fire department. Uh, the, the, the Councilor Adams, to, to you asked about uh, about cost and the upfront membership. We realize we have a clothing allowance. We get $450 a year for uniforms. When we changed our uniforms, we used to wear the gray uh, golf shirts. When we changed to the blue button downs with the badge, we looked more professional. We felt we were more professional, but that was a local driven, uh, and a union driven initiative. We approached the city about changing that. So we accepted that we would be on the hook from our clothing allowance for those uniforms because that was brought forward by us. We accepted that. This change was brought on, like I said, we found out about it last minute. This was nothing we had any input in for. So we feel that the city not our clothing allowances, should cover that initial change. And again, I go back to the professionalism. If I'm showing up wearing a Northampton Fire Department captain's badge, and my firefighters are all wearing fire rescue badges, and we're, not this, we're still the same guys, we're still the same crew, but the public sees four people wearing four different uniforms, and that to me speaks to professionalism. We, again, we strive for that professional look along with the job we do. We're professional in everything we do. That, to me, is has got to change. It needs to be done all at once or not at all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, are there any other questions relative to this particular issue? Any other discussion points? Okay. Um, that's actually all we have signed up. We have a lot more people here. Claudia, you want to come up? <clears throat> Thank you, Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. It's nice to be here without the clock ticking, although I hope to be brief. Um, I'm here to speak about an issue that hasn't come up that I've seen in the paper or at the meetings, and that's about the situation for the arts in the city. Uh, you know, I have to go get something, sorry. In 1989, <laughs> some of you have been around as long as I have, remember there was a cultural plan developed in Northampton. And I was a member of the committee that issued the cultural plan. I was on the school committee, and I was elected actually out of this issue of arts in the school. So arts has been on my agenda for a long time. And I'm currently on the board of the Center for the Arts for a number of years. I think this is my last year. So. Um, when the cultural plan came out in 1989, you know, it was chaired by the late and great Bart Gordon, who the, the um, room was named for, the Center for the Arts, the performance space, the old Center for the Arts. And, and it, it was, it, it's, he stated this, many recommendations require no funds, but rather organizational steps and modest encouragement. In particular, the report suggests municipal actions to foster and coordinate cultural activities. 
um, and a small amount of municipal funds requested, but the far more important is the inclusion and recognition of the cultural community in municipal affairs. So the report was submitted, but apparently never adopted by the city council. And even though Bart said this wasn't going to sit on the shelves and gather dust, it has, except for maybe a few people like me who continue. It's like an albatross maybe around our neck that we carry around with us and we haul out. And so I've been to many meetings of the subcommittee for the council that was called like arts and culture. I mean, some of you have probably seen me there with Penny Burke and various other people. And we've come to try to really point out that there are these difficulties in the way the arts is organized in the city. And um, we haven't actually gotten that far in, in managing, managing to get people to pay attention to what the issues are around this organization. And on some level, I think it's because the arts chugged along, and the Center for the Arts was chugging along, and the Arts Council and the Academy, and we continue to have a, what seems like a very lively arts community. But in, last year, or in the last couple of years, a couple of very significant things happened. One was that the lease ran out on this uh, space for the Center for the Arts, and it was this committee that kind of fostered that, uh, that lease that came up and designated that we would take on the Center for the Arts there at the old College Street School. So we lost our lease and we had to start looking for a new space and Bob Silman, the longtime chair of the Arts Council, resigned his position. And so in that opening, um, in that moment or in these moments where there were these various parts of the arts community that were going to be reconfigured, there was nobody who stepped forward, um, although I think we tried, I think Penny had some meetings with the mayor's office and various people have tried to say that, to say this is a moment when we should think of reorganization. So this is a very long introduction to my point, which is that that when I read that the plan was coming out and that this was it, it was like yes or no, and that there was no, there was no, there had been no discussion <coughs> about what were the possibilities to reorganize in the arts community. I was really shocked, to be honest, because I'm on the board at the Center for the Arts, and it had never come to our attention that that this was a chance, you know, for us to like engage with the Arts Council and the Academy to talk about was there a better way, a more economical way, a just, just a different way to think about organizing arts in the city. And so I'm, I'm coming on some level to mourn that lost opportunity and to say that that I, I, I'm not sure exactly what I want you to do to do with this, um, this this statement that I, I have for you, except to say that there is a great need in the city for, for the city to be more actively involved. We have, instead of being more incorporated into the municipal government, which was the plan in 1989 that we laid out, you know, we've been s sort of shunted further and farther away. So there used to be a subcommittee, I think, that was called Arts and Culture. And now, I think, we're with Veterans Affairs. And so when one goes to these meetings, and I know you're all very put upon and you have lots of issues to deal with, I mean, this falls so far out of the, of the purview of anybody that no, there's nobody actually, um, you know, has enough information to kind of come forward to the council and say, well, has anybody thought about what will happen, you know, when Bob Silman retires and now the Center for the Arts uh, has lost its space? And so, just in conclusion to say that the Center for the Arts has lost its space and we have this space at 33 Holly Street. And 33 Holly Street, which is the new Arts Trust buildings, is a very exciting, uh, endeavor and it's like this collaboration of these local organizations the city has been very hands off on this even in terms of a press conference or grand openings or whatever and and it's been a difficult process it it's again an opportunity you know for to to strengthen arts in the city but i guess i'm I'm, I'm just throwing this out onto you and, and asking you to consider what might happen, even if you can't 
um, in this new plan build in some sort of arts reorganization that in the aftermath you would think that of a, a different subcommittee, a better subcommittee, a way to actually, you know, try to bring the arts, which really are an economic generator, they are a defining element of the city to actually try to be more actively engaged as a city government with with it. So I'm just leaving you with this kind of plea and um, this stating the lost moment here. So hey, Claudia, just for the, um, for clarification, these these are the mayor's administrative orders establishing committees with the new charter. The the committee that you refer to as a council committee. Um, that's under our, our aegis. These, uh, what's being presented is what comes under the mayor's aegis, which is the the arts and cultural department now. Right. It's the right. renaming and right. rebranding, right. if you will. Right. So and the, I, uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. And the other thing is that these are all subject to change, not uh, by us at this point, but the mayor at the mayor's discretion, whoever the mayor is, may change and propose. So w I sensed in your, your testimony there was some sense of finality to this and there isn't and the fact that this is still dynamic and that that it's still viable and your advocacy actually um, is is not gone for a loss and it doesn't it doesn't end here so that you have an opportunity but, but there are two constituencies that you lobby at this point as opposed to this kind of amorphous group before now you lobby the councilors and you can lobby the mayor for uh, the the committee that the uh, council of the bards chairs that's now SSVCR, which sounds, yes, it sounds right. like a... I know that we're already heading to this committee in <coughs> January. Or well, good, good. And that's an opportunity to present and make the case. And I know the pennies appeared before them several yes, times. Yes, we, we... And, and, and um, I just wanted to define the landscape for you, just so you understand what this is. This is actually mandated by charter that there is more distinct separation between what the mayor has... Uh, authority over and what the council has authority over and and I think a lot of the confusion that you're describing actually was generated by the fact that no one really knew who was accountable for what and uh, to date and I, I'm disappointed to hear that the council did not approve um, <laughs> It's too late, Bill. It was 30 some years ago. You well, you know what? It's not too late because, in so much as the council, I think it's not inappropriate for them to reconsider and update and consider a report, something along that line. I I'm just saying that that I want you to walk away with a little more optimism than than you stepped up with. That's all. Well, can I ask you a question though? Sure. In this document if we were to reorganize and say have a arts an arts coordinator for the city rather than having the arts council and the academies of it would happen in this document if if that were to be that, yeah and what, what and what is it okay the, sorry. The, mayor, the mayor can respond to that but point of fact that what you're describing is yeah. does come under the aegis of the mayor so I, I just do want to speak to this issue because one of the goals for uh, as it related to arts and culture um, was there was this perception because the city department was called the Arts Council, uh, which in most communities is a, is a volunteer board. Most communities don't even have a staffer uh, that works for the city. And so um, one of my goals uh, in, in cr actually moving away from calling the advisory body and the department the same name, Arts Council, I've, I've called this now the Arts and Culture Department, and I view Mr. Foote, Brian Foote, to be the city's director of arts and culture. Yes, he also, one of his principal duties is working as the staff person to the Arts Council, but I view his portfolio as much broader than that. Uh, for example, working on the newly created uh, cultural district. Um, which he was heavily involved in, uh, working on issues, uh, representing the city on the Arts Trust, uh, representing the city, um, looking for, for grants, uh, look, uh, dealing with the issue that I know that they care about uh, related to um, affordable space for artists. And the other thing that's important to note that in the FY15 budget, as part of this transition, I've actually increased the staffing um, for this new department. So. Uh, Brian Foote is now a 35-hour employee um, for the city of Northampton. Uh, that's a different, that's a distinction from the past. Bob Silman 
um, was a 20-hour employee by the city. He was also paid 20 hours by the Young at Heart Chorus um, and was the executive director of that. So when Young at Heart went away, when, when Mr. Silman re retired, we did kind of a reassessment. And so, and I will also credit the Arts Council because they've also stepped up and put in additional funding to help support that position as well as uh, uh, Steve Sanderson's position, which is now, I believe, a halftime position. So actually, I feel like we, we, what I'm attempting to do in this is to really broaden the, um, our, our commitment to arts and culture, um, have staff that's dedicated, obviously, to working on the important mission that the Arts Council does, because they, you know, the Arts Council receives lottery funds, et cetera, um, the arts lottery funds, and has to distribute them. There's also now being created, um, again, as sort of a reorganization within a reorganization, the Arts Council has now divided its board and created a true 501c3 board uh, that's going to be, I think it's called Northampton Arts Inc., um, which is really going to focus on the 501c3 fundraising aspects um, to, to be able to fund the second grant round. So um, I actually think what we're doing here is in, is in line with um, the concerns that Claudia has, and I've actually talked with uh, Mr. Foote about the cultural plan, and I do think it's something that we um, need to take a look at and update. Um, as for um, my reorganization, including other nonprofit arts groups, that's really not appropriate. Um, I can't really, I can't really uh, lasso all those different arts groups and, and, and contain them in this order. But what I do see is having a strong arts and culture department and a director who's engaged in that process. And then finally, before I answer questions, I do want to say that with regards to the new arts uh, trust facility at 33 Holly Street, I've been to many of their events. I've written grant support letters on behalf of the one or two or three grants that they've applied for. And obviously, I've, I've brought state officials there to tour the facility. So I am committed to trying to help them be successful because I think they'll, that will help Northampton's art scene ultimately remain viable and sustainable and successful. So, thank you. Um, some comments and some questions and some comments about Ms. Lefkoe's uh, um, concerns. As the former chair of the Cultural and Recreational Services Committee for the City Council, um, it was uh, uh, our role to do some of that lassoing that the mayor just mentioned in terms of trying to reach out to many of the various arts organizations that seemed pretty disparate across the city and also try to you know, bring in line what was the defined role of each of these bodies in our, our then charter uh, and the ordinances that created them to see that they were actually doing what they were doing. I think we have an opportunity now in the, in the newly formed um, uh, social services, veterans affairs, and and uh, culture and recreation. <laughs> yes. So even though there are many concerns, um, it, there's still the opportunity, and I'm sure I trust Councilor Labarge is do doing the same work that we did in terms of outreach to those various arts bodies across the city, making sure that there's a bully pulpit, a, a way for the council to liaison between those concerns and then to the, the city council itself and keep those at the forefront because you know Northampton at one point was touted as the you know the top uh, small arts mm -hmm. city in the United States so I think those of us who are really concerned about that agree with you that the, these concerns about arts and culture need to be at the foreground and whatever way we can do that in coordination with the mayor is, I think would be most successful and you said you had some questions it was actually more of a, a comment on Ms. Lefko's concern. So I don't think I have a question to the mayor. Okay. Uh, Council Yes. And I just talked with Penny Burke again. This well, was Sunday, Sunday afternoon. And um, they are coming in in November to our social services and veterans affairs. As I look at like Councillor Carney was saying that they had the overall of that committee and then it was placed into our committee I feel with cultural and recreation it should be part of the Arts Council I think they need to have a subcommittee with that because I think there's so much involved and hearing what we're being told that there is not a relationship 
with the city and we're trying to get that relationship so I think what the mayor has talked about is that he has been trying to make these changes and I think he's going in the right direction I mean, yes. Yeah, please uh, send up the call. I mean, maybe I feel a little bit like um, the man who spoke from the fire department, sorry, I forgot your name, about being involved in the conversation. Because, I mean, on some level, you know, of course, um, the, the Center for the Arts puts on First Night, which is like this major event in the city. And it's, but we're on our own, you know, I mean, and so now if there is like a culture of the, like if, if we've got Brian Foote as the... No, no, but I, just just to say that that it does maybe maybe you know I guess I didn't know that this was going to be how, how this has happened and, and I take responsibility for that. But I'm just you know as I so my fear is that that the the center that what's always been the problem is that the relationship between the arts council and the uh, center for the arts isn't clear. It was tried we tried to clarify it with this document and and perhaps. This this new way forward will do it, but I guess I'm just here to say I feel like that that the conversation the, uh, we've had time before this came out for this conversation, and I don't think the Center for the Arts was part of it, and so I I guess I'll just quit, you know, because maybe you know maybe this will my appearance here will spark more collaboration, you know, down the the line, and and it will, and hopefully in 30 years from now I won't toddle in here with the culture report and say nothing ever came of it. So thanks thanks for Th your time. Thank, thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Um, Again, uh, anyone else wish to speak on any other point relative to uh, the proposed <coughs> administrative realignment? Um, speak now or forever hold your peace. This is, uh, um, now, I should say that um, part of the reason that we extended the hearings was uh, to provide an opportunity for members of the Board of Public Works or people associated with the Department of Public Works to make to, to express their concerns or even their approval or their recommendations so that we can have a better, more intimate understanding about what the attitudes are concerning. That's, of course, as has been noted in uh, both the Gazette and the Republican and in public discussions, the most significant change is the uh, status of the Board of Public Works. Um, and as such, I've heard peripherally some concerns expressed, but I, I think the council would be interested in hearing directly from anyone if they're willing to speak to you. That was a long <laughs> invitation to MJ. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am Jay Adams. I've sat on the Board of Public Works since I think 2006. And I came to it after uh, having did a little stint with the Solid Waste Long Range Planning Task Force in 2001. So I must say that I walked into the Board of Public Works really having a pretty well um, formulated understanding of enterprise funds, largely thank you John Musanti, who taught us all about it, who sat on that committee. And I sat with Jim Dostel and Mike Parsons. And as I came back to the Board of Public Works in, I think, 2006, um, you know, there, there was a lot of discussion, but one of the things that really I was really struck by was, boy, if I hadn't had that tutorial from John Musanti earlier, I would have been lost in that conversation about the finances and the assets and how we as a, a board needed to think through that and make, a long, make planning, do planning, sound financial planning for what we needed to invest in our infrastructure so that we can move forward. And I think that that's what I bring here tonight, is that concern that that level of detail, that level of understanding of the physical plant that, that we as the Board of Public Works manage uh, in conjunction with the, the director of the department, but that um, it's a pretty complicated system and it's a pretty critical system to make sure that you're keeping an eye not on, only on the immediate concerns of making sure it's well maintained, but sort of the long range vision of how we expect that set of sewer, water, now solid waste, or now um, uh, stormwater facilities to really serve the people of Northampton for the long term. Uh, and to think long range as we're making financial decisions about what are our rates going to be every year. And I think that that's what I personally feel um, most compelled to speak about. 
is that you can't go in there with a short-term vision of trying to understand the context that we have to make decisions in in a very short term. And that's why I think the value of the Board of Public Works as it works now is, is that people come on, they come up to speed, they stay for a while. I mean, how many times do we have to ask Jim Dostal to step off? Um, but uh, it's that background of understanding both the physical, the engineering, and the financial context that the decision making happens in that we need to be mindful. And I think that that's what we're most concerned about is that uh, there are many things on the mayor's plate. There are many things on the council's plate. And we feel, oh, well, I feel, I'll speak for myself. I can't speak for the board as a whole. But the conversation about, boy, this is a lot of information to come up to speed on and to have a long range vision, not just a short term, but also to be able to look in the long range in terms of where we need to make investments, what it means in terms of planning the long term financials, how rates are going to go up, and um, how to manage that reasonably in the context of all the other financial decisions that the city needs to make. And I worry because I look at, you know, the roads, and we hear all the time that the roads are in rough shape. Those are, you know, part of the, the city that, you know, the city's major functions, education, public safety, and infrastructure. It feels like infrastructure is the, the lost child, the child that doesn't get the investment in them because it's, you know, the other things seem higher priority. And I think that the Board of Public Works can keep that primary focus on those primary things, and again, I'll say this, the, the long-term vision. That's why I think the board, as it operates now, with its eye towards the, the investments that we need to make to make sure that the infrastructure is maintained and invested in a way that serves the, the long-term interest of the city well is critical. So. Uh, Councilor Dunn. Um, <clears throat> th thank you, uh, Ms. Adams. And I just, I, I would also add an observation that the other pressure we face is, um, lack of interest in the state in, in, in investing in the infrastructure of the cities and towns. And so, you know, um, another, I think, very valued function that the Board of Public Works brings through its expertise is kind of dealing with that and, and um, dealing with a very difficult situation. I guess my only question is, when I, when I look at the order, um, I guess I wonder, is, is all the expertise on the Board of Public Works something you think will be lost, um, the ability to plan long term, do you, do you think that will be lost or do you think it can be maintained in the new, uh, under the new uh, proposal? It, when I read it, I, I, I assume that it can, but I mean, what's, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll tell you, I've had the very good fortune to serve under two extraordinary chairmen uh, in that board and Dave Recknow and now Terry Culhane um, have been extraordinary board leaders and I feel like we got the best board in the city because it runs well because there's that um, that sense that we're not a rubber stamp board, that we're invested in the conversations, that there's it works because work is spread out among the people on the board who step up and bring their expertise but also their time and energy to certain aspects of it. I mean, we saw it with the storm stormwater utility piece, a small group worked on that. We've seen it with the, uh, the transfer station and the managing the landfill, that little subgroups are, are designated to work on it. You know, I, 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 I don't want to, I mean, I understand that the model that the mayor is presenting works well in other communities. I'm just speaking from my experience, and I think that um, as you sit there and as you're making decisions, and your decisions have real consequences for the people, for us, I mean, I, I feel the rate impacts also, as do all my neighbors, and they let me know about it. Um, but um, the, the conse you feel the consequences pretty directly. Uh, and I'm not sure that I would feel that same level if I were just a advisory board. I mean, I, I love this stuff, personally, and I'm fascinated that, that everyone else on the board really seems to love that stuff. But that's because we feel like we have a real, we have skin in the game. It feels like we have a real stake. And I don't know how that tone will change. I hope it doesn't, but I know that I personally, you know, have invested a lot of time and energy to keeping myself up to speed and learning more about the, the environment that we're working in. Because I feel like there's real consequence to my decision making as I sit as a board member. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Carney, then Councilor Adams, then Councilor. Um, thank you, MJ. Um, for all the work you've been doing on that board but from the task force you said prior to appointment on the solid waste committee and I, 
I have to agree with you. I think it is probably one of, if not the hardest working board in the city. Uh, I find your arguments very compelling um, in terms of um, <coughs> in terms of the investment that that you said that the members themselves make. And these are one thing that's I, I, that people forget is that these these boards are. Uh, so ultimately volunteer boards. This is nothing but a labor of love for the people who, who do this work and it is um, greatly appreciated by uh, by me and, and I would hope by most of the citizens in Northampton. So that being said, um, um, I will definitely take under consideration your thoughts that um, somehow having that that independence that um, piece that allows this board to make those decisions is an integral part of the way that you do your work and while at the same time I understand the the mayor's uh, wish to reorganize and why as a way of being able to have more direct authority over the day-to-day -day operations um, it makes it a difficult choice for me to think about this knowing um, how much every member of that board has invested over the years and thank you for testifying tonight to that. can I respond a little bit to what you've said I mean there have been times when we were making decisions about you know what street musician can play on Main Street I'm happy to give up that piece of the <laughs> job I mean there there's a, you know I've actually asked in the meetings I said is, do all of these have? Do all of these decisions have to come to us? Aren't there things that we could just delegate to the director? And and that conversation has been going on, and we have started to do that. But I think that the big picture stuff is really critical. And you know, I look at the work that you guys do, and I look at the work that the mayor has on his plate, and I think, oh my God, to add another big piece, which is you know how the water and sewer gets delivered and taken away from the residences and the businesses and how reliable that is and what sort of investments we need to make really requires a long range and in-depth understanding of those facilities. And I worry that as we move away from that, that we become an advisory board, that the impact, that the investment that the people who sit in that advisory board might not be as deep if they don't feel like they don't have skin in the game because it is, we are setting the budgets, we are setting the ready, and we feel very much compelled to make sure that those are responsible and reasonable, both for the people here today and for the grandchildren who will be there, you know, 40 years from now. So. Council the Barge and then Councilor Adams. Why do you feel uncomfortable, MJ, as it being an advisory board? I, I think what I just said, Marianne, is, is that I feel like when we have a, a real stake in making the financial decisions and the financial recommendations, <coughs> um, that it causes us to be much more diligent and heightened about it's our decision and we have to own it we, we have a real stake in it uh, I feel like as an advisory board you know people step onto advisory boards and might not have the same level of commitment or willingness to invest in themselves to come up to speed on that when there's not that um, <laughs> that stakeholder right I also that think I that the mayor has a big stakeholder oh in oh this also. I, I agree I agree. You know, I, and I have to say, MJ, that I have several residents that on my ward are very pleased about the mayor making it an advisory board. That's their feelings toward that. And I can be down in Hamp and people are saying they think it's a great way in the direction that the mayor is going into. I want to thank you for all the time that you put on that board. And I know in your heart you do an excellent job. Right. Question for the mayor. Um, with respect to the water and sewer fee change, um, I, I support that change and have since the charter discussions. Could you explain the process? When we, if, if we were to take over that, that, that duty, um, would, we, would we have the power to simply say yes or no to the recommendation, or would we have the power to adjust it? The way it's described in your in the administrative code um, is that it would be like the other financial, um, you know, it would fall into the other financial provisions. The way we handle financial matters, so the Department of Public Works would make a recommendation to me in consultation with uh, the Public Works Commission. Uh, would make a recommendation to me. I would then have to um, 
submit that rate to the city council and, like you, and you would have the ability to uh, to vote it up or down or to or to make changes to it it would that be in a specific order in a financial order in the form of that would be my uh, I mean it's I mean right now theoretically it's embedded I mean it's always been embedded in the budget because the revenues that that are derived from the rate are are part of the budget that gets submitted so um, uh, my sense would be probably it would be a separate vote um, because it would be important to to know what that vote is because in order to build the budget you would need to understand how much revenue uh, the department could rely on most other cities around us do it as a separate vote some do fold it into the budget um, uh, that's something we'll have to think about the timing on that, because regular budgetary items we have the we can or, or the budget as a whole you have the power to cut cut and not add not so I was wondering increase. if we would have to add to would have the power to increase I just that's an interesting question I'll have to do some research on that um, thank you yeah I'd have to do some research on that uh, Councilor Specter and then Councilor <clears throat> this wasn't why I initially raised my hand but I would hope we would have a separate vote and I would hope we would be able to increase as well as cut and just because the amount of work it also involves I would hope it would be separate from as other communities do before the before the budget. Yeah, that's my that would be my uh, that would be my expectation but as well. Yeah. What I actually wanted to say was both praise for you on the process because I've heard some things in terms of process that counselors and I can't speak for the public process, but that counselors were even cut out and weren't allowed to speak with you. I want to speak to this one because, in fact, we've had a process together on this and we spoke about this. You reached out to me and. Um, I disagree with you on this, but I won't. But but the praise is that you were very open to hearing my arguments, and that's different than people saying the process was terrible, which is saying I heard you, but I don't agree with you. So you and I, I still would prefer I don't agree with this particular change, but I don't feel like you didn't hear my arguments and come back, and I can also hear your arguments as well, and I appreciate that dialogue that I had with you, and I st I have some of the same concerns having someone who worked with various kinds of boards for many years in terms of consulting, that sometimes there's just, it, it's harder to, to kind of um, concretize this. But when people have a decision, when they're making the vote, there is a way, I think, MJ, you were coming to this, there's some way they take more responsibility for it. And no question that ultimately you're going to have the responsibility one way or the other. But I do have a little concern because this board, which I've seen operating for so long, has been a really great board. And I do think it creates some difference when people do not have that that final vote. There's some it may be different, but I just I don't I do I do take exception if that then by implication that every other advisory board is an insignificant board and doesn't serve a valuable I, purpose, whether I, it's the Human Rights Commission or the Arts Council or the no, Transportation some, and Parking Commission, which I served on. Well, uh, again, I, our dial I appreciate those the dialogue that yeah. I, I don't think that's true in some ways. I think that there's a unique role that the DPW plays, and I've been on the joint committee. Which is it again, the DPW uh, or the BPW? BPW. Oh, okay. BPW. see, it's confusing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's one reason we should change those yeah. names. I mean, but that the intricacy of what they're dealing with and the technicality is very different from any other advisory board like Human Rights that I've seen and the kind of long-range planning. So we've been through this discussion. I think we just have a different approach, but. We definitely have a different approach, yeah. But, but I respect your approach to it. Thanks. Uh, and just as a point of information, uh, I've been in consultation with Councillor Adams uh, about establishing a public works committee for the council, similar to the public safety. Um, and that will come before you. Uh, he's right. drafted some language that conforms to the other committees that we have. But uh, that there has been some expressed concern about the absence of the liaison committee and, and consequently uh, greater insulation between the two departments. Just, just to that point, would that be similar to our joint committee that we have had for years? It, it, it d different in that the joint committee is a liaison committee, so there's three members from uh, uh, the Board of Public Works and three members from the council. So my so question is, it, would there be collaboration <coughs> with the... It'd be less, it would not be collaborative in so far as no more or less collaborative than a public safety committee, for instance. The, it, is, it is for informational purposes. It's for 
keeping avenues and, and communication open between uh, the council and the, the Department of Public Works and, and their projects. Is this to that point? Because I, I didn't want to open a can of worms just now, <laughs> just because there are uh, outdoor dollars <laughs> queued up. to this new information okay. that you're bringing up, and it might not be appropriate until we, we, we consider this on the council floor. But, exactly. Um, I am kind of curious about how that structure is going to work because, for instance, we have a number of folks from uh, the DPW working on uh, transportation and parking uh, issues in that commission. And so I'm wondering if it makes more sense, in fact, to have a committee or commission <coughs> that works with the council that's specific to the DPW related issues that we're missing. So it's not general. Well, that's, well, that's, that's what it's being described this is a dedicated by the council now parking and transportation is a joint committee that's established by the mayor the um, whereas it is staffed um, at the mayor's pleasure but the fact is this would be a committee like public safety I think is a good parallel that uh, allowing uh, the council or or SSVCR for that matter allowing uh, the council to be in contact and discuss and to ask department heads about the issues as they're coming up. Um, and an example would be, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds in this one, but for instance, the stormwater initiation, which, which actually was kind of a model that leads us into where we're having these discussions now. But how that group would, that would be the group that would conduct the hearings. That would be the group that would preside over those issues and then become informational. And that's the group that, uh, items would be referred to, for instance, when uh, setting rates and such. You refer to the the, the public works uh, committee, which in turn would speak with the department heads and with the advisory board to get their sense of what's going on. So I think we're misunderstanding one another. So I think we should okay. figure well, and out. We, and, we'll, and, we'll, and this is all presuming that this this, this of course yeah. passes the council yeah. and these administrative orders are enacted and so on and so forth and, and that only triggers that it should that occur and if that occurs then then we will have ample time to discuss it because we'll it will be a condition of our rules and but an ordinance an order will be established for that uh councilor o'donnell um, Councilor Adams. thank thank you i also had a question for the mayor um if, if you don't mind um about the, the one thing that i think is the most important part of, of this discussion well the part that i'm not worried about i guess um, is the kind of the dedication of the members of this commission. I actually do think of the Transportation and Parking Commission. I, I have, you know, limited experience compared to, to some on, on this commission, including yourself and Councilor Carney and others. But um, I've always been impressed by how prepared and, and dedicated and serious even the, the citizen members of the commission are. And um, I think it does very good work despite it being technically just an advisory body. So that part, that part doesn't worry me, losing that expertise, and I, I don't see that as an issue. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to address um, the issue of, of long-term planning. Because it seems to me that the Public uh, Works Commission will still have a chance to contribute to long-term planning and, and, um, and, and think far ahead about infrastructure needs. And I'm wondering if you could just explain your thoughts on how this will function in terms of preparing um, for, for the future in advance. Yeah, I mean, I think one. I think um, I think the and the area of planning is probably the area where the commission can be, um, you know, most beneficial to the uh, to the department. I mean, the department, the professionals, the engineers, the folks who are um, in the field doing this work, um, are the ones that are are um, going to be working uh, to put together these plans, and and the commission will provide a good sounding board on the. Um, on the development of these plans, uh, and, and I think that's a, a very good uh, way to describe that relationship. I think the difference is that we're moving away from sort of an, a sense of an operational control of the DPW versus that sort of planning advisory role. Um, and again, leaving the fiduciary decisions uh, to, um, to either professional staff uh, and or the elected officials um, and, and, and having it be advisory. Um, and again, uh, the role of having hearings, for example, I think would still continue for this for this commission, um, including for things like uh, you know street acceptances or things like that that the department needs to consider. 
um, there still are going to be times uh, to have you know hearings, hearings on plan, long-term planning, et cetera. So I, I do think that there's a role, uh, just like many of our other uh, departments, I mean, many of our other advisory role complement the professional departments by adding that citizen input and, and, and creating a body in which you can have a public forum. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Adams and Councilor Khan. Uh, for, for anyone who might be concerned that the Board of Public Works and City Council Conference Committee um, might lose, th the loss of that might, might, might be um, uh, noticeable at, at, at a minimum. I did draft a, um, a, a proposal to keep it the exact same structure but but may, but I made but, but but what I drafted made it similar to um, what we see in in the proposed reorganization, um, the structure of the Transportation and Parking Commission and the Energy and Sustainability Commission, um, where you you know the, the, the mayor would not be able to, due to the separation of powers, mandate counselors beyond it, but um, like like in those committees that I just referenced, or in the multiple member bodies that I just referenced, um, there could be three public public um, elected officials appointed those committees. So what I did was I took, I, I drafted that, and, I, and I, <clears throat> I did present it to the mayor, and I don't want to speak to the mayor, but I think it was the mayor's preference to, to not go in that direction. Um, and mayor, you can speak to that if you want to, because I, I think the mayor thought that there's a distinction between those, those committees, um, the ones that I use as a template um, and a reference point and, and, the, and the proposal that I drafted. So unfortunately, uh, I'm, uh, well, well, I can certainly circulate that if counselors would like to see it. It would basically keep the exact same structure, but make it as, in the, in, in, as, as a multiple member body. Unfortunately, the only way to 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 um, implement that would be to vote to invoke to, to be to vote the, the entire thing down because we can't amend this. So, if counselors are interested, I can circulate that. But if not, as Councilor Dwight referenced, I, I mean, I, well, I'll be coming forward with proposal if if the order passes and if that committee's abolished to, to create a public um, safety, excuse me, a, a public works commission um, or a public works committee. <clears throat> It'll function like the public safety committee if, if it happens. Um, where we would be able to request any department employee um, and any, any member of the, of the board of public works to appear before us, but it wouldn't be the same sort of um, meeting where, where board members would be at every, every meeting it wouldn't be the same exact structure like the joint committee is currently. Um, so, you know, we, we there is a way of creating it so it's the exact same. I, I think. Mayor, to that point. I'm sure you you were next uh, anyway. Uh, uh, just to, just to that point, I, I just um, and I know we're getting off the administrative uh, hearing a little bit by by talking about this, but my sense is that that would not be inappropriate for that to be one other feature of the Public Safety Committee in the sense that we've talked about the Department of Public Works being very much a public safety entity dealing with the safety of roads and uh, many of those other things. And if rather than establishing another, maybe there would be a simple way of just including the Department of Public Works as one of those other departments with whom the public, uh, the Committee on Public Safety regularly meets and discusses operations. That was one piece. And then the other piece was a procedural question maybe for the mayor. Um, so uh, typically right now, if there are ordinances that come before the council, um, we refer them to the planning board or to others. So similarly, would we be uh, would it be within our purview to refer ordinances that we think need to be vetted by the um, Public Works Commission? Would we be then within our rounds to refer those yes. with, with the requirement that that come back with some recommendation for against or without? Yes, and it's, that's, stated in, that's stated in my order. Okay. That, that would be a function of that committee. Just like any of our advisory committees, you could, um, you could refer matters to them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, as, as for the um, public safety committee for the council, I, I think all issues relevant to that should, will cross that bridge when it yeah. when and if it, it should be yeah. applied. Problem. But yeah, and that's in your recommendations noted. Uh, Emery, would you like to speak to this point? Can I speak again? 
Yes. Yeah. This is the first, let me. I've been corrected. <laughs> I have three quick points I'd like to make. Everyone who voted for the charter knew there would be a reorganization. Coming forward at the last minute and saying they weren't involved suggests to me they didn't know when they voted for the charter what they were voting for, or they just have not been involved. <coughs> the time is now. There was plenty of time to be involved all along. <coughs> Go to the mayor, whatever. I would like to challenge the notion that an advisory committee doesn't have skin in the game. I just chaired a committee of 11 people on the stormwater uh, ordinance. I believe everyone in the committee felt they had skin in the game. I simply do not accept the idea that an advisory board won't have skin in the game. I'd be happy to lead another committee to show you that it's possible. I don't accept that idea. Having an elected board that can tax the people and they're not elected is simply taxation without re representation. In any way you cut it, that's the case. This country was founded on the notion there should be an unelected board that could cause citizens to pay money. We should not forget that idea. Uh, if you'd like to speak, you can come up and identify yourself. My name is Peg Whittem, and I live at 112 Chestnut Street in Florence. And I guess I'm just your basic public person who votes for everything that needs to get voted for in Northampton. I guess my concern is sort of the same as yours. Emery, is that your name? Because it, it really boggles my mind when I work really hard to conserve my water. And I look at my water bill and I say, whoo, it's much higher than it was. What have you been doing, Peg? You've been wasting water. But I haven't been wasting water. I've been conserving water, but my rates have gone up. Now, they went up between the last bill and this bill that I just got through paying. And I guess my concern is the arbitrary just, it just happens. And I'm wondering if under the reorganization, this kind of happening will have more process and people will have more input to the process. Because I don't feel I have any input at all. And I'm one of the probably the min minority population in Northampton, I am now retired. And I think now if something happened to my husband, one quarter of my pension would go toward my property taxes and then my water bill and my storm water bill. And I can understand paying those taxes. I don't dislike paying taxes. I think it's important to pay taxes. But I guess my concern is when taxes are levied by a body that's not elected to levy the taxes, I guess I get a little concerned. That's Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions? For the, uh, MJ, do you mind? I, I, I want to follow up actually on this point. I mean, um, the, the and, and I'm sorry, can you step up again? I'm sorry. The, um, the issue of accountability, and, and you mentioned skin in the game, and, and actually I do believe that your, the decisions that have been made by the Board of Public Works have been, have done, they have done so with that notion ever foremost in their minds when they made these decisions. And ultimately, um, I also understand, and I think this is Councilor Spector's argument, is possibly the desire or the need to create an insulation 
because of these generically unpopular decisions of having to actually levy fees and and uh, taxes mm -hmm. and um, providing political cover, if you will, because essentially politicians are considered to be essentially dictated by their prospects and their and and we we base all of our decisions on uh, the potential of getting reelected because we get paid a lot of money. <laughs> and the, the, the thing is, is that, that this point of accountability is rather important. And, and it is important because it is, it is a notion that we subscribe to, everybody subscribes to in this country, hopefully, that the fact that, yeah, you may actually have some adults trying to decide whether it's appropriate to raise your rates and your fees. And you have the opportunity to say, I want that dolt to go home at, during the election cycle. There are no adults on the advisory committee or the Board of Public Works because actually they're chosen for their, their innate abilities and their actual education and understanding. So they do bring unique perspectives to these things that we're, we're more dilettantes in that respect. I must say that I have, in the course of my service as a counselor, my education has been amplified <coughs> a thousandfold. I didn't know about hazmat rescues. I didn't know. I didn't know about trench rescues. I didn't know about the the uh, the stormwater system of the city of Northampton and the levees and dikes. I don't. Uh, my I <coughs> discovered in this job how deep the depths of my ignorance were. But the fact is, is that I, I think the thing is that, that concerns me during this discussion is that the counselors actually do. I mean, I think I, I'll pay the due respect to the counselors who actually do a lot of the heavy lifting. And I think, and I would use the stormwater uh, fee as an excellent example, because ultimately we set that fee, mm -hmm. and we set that fee with, I mean, once upon a time, even predating your tenure on the on the BPW. The BPW pretty much would have said, boom, there's the fee, there's the enterprise fund, bada boom, bada bing. And people would get very upset as a result, understandably, I think. And this time with the chair from the Board of Public Works, it was understood that the, the, the significance of this particular fee that was talk, being discussed, to bring in the public discussion, to bring in Emery and his committee to to consult with the spectrum of people and, and professionals uh, in the community that can help us make this decision. And we relied on that. And it was critical. And I think everyone, as Emery stated, knows who in year 22 had a distinct sense of skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So this is the long preamble to the question, which is, and I think this is kind of what Councilor O'Donnell was getting to with, with this new establishment, despite the fact that the uh, Council Spectre was concerned of not enough insulation from political decisions. But do you think that we will, the, the Department of Public Works and by extension the city will suffer uh, because people from the what's now the BPW would no longer feel committed enough to participate and that we wouldn't be able to find people qualified to participate in an advisory capacity. That's my concern because if, if that would be a significant loss, no doubt, that would be a significant loss and I would feel pretty much at sea. But do you in your heart of hearts think that that is a possibility? I wish I, could, I, I wish I could answer that in a way that I had confidence in. I can only speak from my own experience. And I know that when I stepped in and <coughs> saw and had to learn the scope of what I needed to understand to be an, a, a, a viable member of that board and to feel like I was contributing, um, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a lot. It was a lot, and I was happy to do it. Um, then again, you know, I grew up playing on the the equipment that they, when they do the sewer intercept, intercept down through my backyard when I was a kid, and the pumping station at the end of Clark Street was in my front yard. So I sort of cut my teeth seeing the physical infrastructure. But there was there's it, you have to have a passion for it. 
And when you have that passion for it, then I think that that can inform um, you, the long term. And, you know, I think that we have an extraordinary set of colleagues on the Board of Public Works, and all of them come very dedicated and prepared and willing to invest themselves. Um, but there have been times, I mean, when the board has sat with an empty seat because we've been short one or, uh, and I worry that I think generally just trying to get people to participate and engage and commit to the long term for public service in a board is a challenge nowadays. So I, I don't, I don't feel like I have a good answer. I don't, I can only speak from my own experience that I felt, um, in my, my civic service on the Board of Public Works, the fact that I knew that it was a pocketbook issue for everybody, including me and my family, um, that um, I felt a real profound sense of responsibility to invest in what I needed to, to feel like I was an, a valuable member of that team. Would you feel less dedicated if you were merely an advisor? Um, I would say no, because I think me and who I am, I will, I will continue to perform at the same level. <laughs> that, I have no doubt about that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's not a board that you can step onto without um, making a strong commitment and, and be willing to stay with for the long term. And I don't, you know, people serve for different reasons. Um, so I know I can only speak from my own experiences that I don't think it will affect my personal service, how I would approach the job or approach this, the service. Um, but I can't speak for others. Because historically, um, the appointments actually sometimes surpass, well, before the charter change, it were longer in some cases than the mayoral terms, and uh, who would be the appointing authority. Mm -hmm. um, we have run into political problems uh, with embedded uh, 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 Board of Public Works members who took issue with the seated mayor, who theoretically they were supposed to be doing be the bidding at the of, pleasure. Right? <laughs> um, and, and the argument has been that, that the, the Department of Public Works and the Board of Public Works, by extension, enjoyed a privilege that no other department had in the community. And not the least of which, of course, is the management of, of one of the more significant budget items in the, in the, in the city. Uh, the school department, of course, we established because it controls and manages such an enormous budget, they actually get their own elected uh, members to represent. And, and, I, and I would hold them up as an example as far as um, how, how we conduct polity. So it, it, it's, and, and I, like Councilor Adams, I've, I've heard ever since I first took the oath of office some time ago that, that this has always been one of the major concerns about the aspect of confusion about where lines of authority and accountability were. And um, essentially we serve as a firewall. Uh, you shouldn't have to, we get paid more than you do. As I said, significantly more than you do. And, 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 and we can pay by getting voted out of office as well. Mm -hmm. um, which some here may look as a blessing, but I don't know. But the, so I, I, what I'm trying to get at is trying to ascertain. How, uh, you express concerns, but I haven't heard you cons express objections. And I, I and I want to and that's one I got want to get a sense of if there's and if maybe I know you can't speak for your colleagues, but maybe you've heard from them to some extent that they actually have objections mm -hmm. as opposed to concerns. Um. I can only speak for myself, and I will say that, that I have concerns, but I have no objections. You know, I voted in support of the charter. I like the direction that city has gone under the charter. I think that, that other cities operate with this sort of form. Um, I just felt compelled that I should stand up and say, this is our concern. I, I profoundly love sitting on the Board of Public Works. I think it's a, an extraordinary committee to sit on. It's interesting and fascinating. I think it's, you know, you get to see a little bit of everything, the underside of the belly, underside of the belly of the city, and also the financial pieces. And, you know, I, I, I actually look forward to seeing if we could expand our role in a different way when we're not spending time signing contracts or deciding on street musicians, you know, to do more advocacy for the infrastructure. 
not just at the city level, but also with the, the elected officials at the state and, and the, the federal level, because I do feel like, you know, it's an incredibly important piece of what makes the city work. And if we don't invest in it, just like if we don't invest in our children, we will be left with a, a skeleton. And that's what I worry about, because this one doesn't yell and doesn't have parents to make sure that we're investing in it. Uh, that the commission, the Board of Public Works, is the, the one who's paying attention to this stuff and yelling for it when we can, and doing what we can to make sure it's being well fed. Well, I, I appreciate you uh, rising to, to my, uh, my call of asking for someone to speak <laughs> to this. I, I appreciate the time you spent Glad here. Glad to do it. And I, uh, most, uh, I very much appreciate your service. So, okay. thank, you. thank you. Anyone else? Claudia. Well, can I just? <coughs> you, you say it at the microphone, so. People just don't hear this disembodied voice. Say something about the difference between volunteer and perhaps paid boards. And by a way of example, like in my neighborhood, which you all know about, Montview Avenue and the zoning issues over there, but there's a small conservation group that's formed, and now we have a 501c3 organization. It's been, we've been in existence for, I don't know, it seems like since for 30 years, at least as long as the Center for the Arts uh, building. But we're a volunteer, group of volunteers, and there's a, there are properties in the city that the city owns that need to be held, that ha need a conservation restriction. Uh, all the city property that is in, con in restriction has to have a group holding a CR. And we have been trying to get a CR, a conservation restriction, on this little piece of property that's across from my house. It's in the Montview neighborhood area. And so we work very diligently. We meet all the time. We've, we've st there are people who know all the conservation restriction rules and regulations. We're in charge with people at the state. And we make these proposals for, for a, a management plan. And we go to the, the city planning department and the conservation commission, and they say no. So we go back to the drawing boards, and we go to more meetings. And I cannot begin to tell you how many hours we have invested in something we care very, very deeply about. But after a certain amount of time, you know, as a volunteer board, I feel like you just can't keep on with it. Whereas if, you know, what I'm hearing MJ say is, and I think it's kind of a very difficult thing to articulate, but if it's your kind of, your, you, your job, more of a job, and you realize that you can actually put in all this time and then in the end you accomplish what you think is the right thing, then I think you do have more uh, skin in the game than if you, because I think people will fall off these boards just like we're all falling off the Montview Conservation Board because how many times can you meet together and try to do this when people have these other things? And so I think it's a subtle difference, but I think it's a significant one. Thank you. Anyone else? Last chance. Um, well, uh, in the absence of any more testimony, um, we uh, I, does do uh, kibitz among the counselors. Any desire to uh, move on, to, to close this public hearing? Is there an interest in having another public hearing, well, Councilor? Can we ask further questions about? Yeah. Oh, please. Yes. So I wish. I wish. There, by the way, this is, as we said, it's a significant document, so there are a lot of other issues. So if you, if you have questions in the mayor on any other aspect of this, please ask them now. Mayor, I have a question um, with respect to the police department. Um, given events in recent memory like Jonas Korea incident and the police payroll matter, I was wondering if you considered at any point looking into the creation of a police commission, with like a, like like some cities have, where there, where it's a a, um, a like a citizen board that would that would meet with with the, the the police chief and possibly yourself as well, and maybe you know an advisory board that would make policy suggestions to the department. Was that ever considered? I know that is one uh, possible option, um, uh, but we did not. I obviously did not uh, make it part. Order. I feel like the um, I feel like the uh, department functions well 
uh, right now. And I also feel like the interactions that it has with the Public Safety Committee provides um, a good level of information for the council, is able to gather information from the police department. So uh, no, it's not part of my order. Um, I, I do understand the model. I know Springfield had it and then they moved away from it. And I think they may have some some kind of something right now. Uh, it's not quite a police commission, but I, I just don't believe that that's a, an issue for a city our size. Any, any further questions? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. you have the floor. Um, this is actually one of the things I discussed with you um, when I met with you. <clears throat> Un under the city solicitor section, um, it, it excludes any mention of um, the city council being um, one of the, the, the well, one of the entities that the, that the solicitor would advise. And um, I understand that in the, in the section 2.02 .02 under city solicitor, under the established section, that it states the mayor and city, that the, that the solicitor will serve as legal counsel to the mayor and city of Northampton, that, that includes the city council. But under authorities and responsibilities, it states that the city solicitor shall provide the city with legal services and with the consent of the mayor may advise any officer or department head on any question of law. So um, it does exclude the um, express reference to, to, to city council as an entity that the solicitor would advise. So um, I'm just unclear about the solicitor's role with respect to the, to the city council. Yeah, I think, I think when we talked about that sentence, I think that sentence is really talking about um, you know, it was really talking about other city employees. Um, uh, I would not consider the council as city employees. I, I would consider, and I think that's mainly in there as a management uh, tool. So that if you know, basically saying that um, that uh, any any officer or department head uh, can ask a question of law, they just have to go through the mayor's office to do that. Um, uh, so I, I don't really know that that is exclusive, excludes the city council. I think the more important piece is that, the, again, up in the establishment clause, that the city solicitor serves as legal counsel to the mayor and to the entire city of Northampton. Um, I mean, he is part of the executive, I mean, he's part of this executive structure. Um, so he's, it's formulated in there, as is the legal services department. Um, but in terms of the... Uh, I mean, again, I think I, I as, we, as when we spoke, I think any time counselors have asked to speak with the city solicitor, they've been given free access to the city solicitor. I don't think I've ever restricted that. I don't think that's ever been um, that's ever been the case. Um, it does kind of walk an interesting line because, again, um, you know, there is the whole issue of sort of the operational management side of of um, you know, of the, of the role of the executive versus the role of the legislative body. But I, I do believe that, you know, in terms of advising the claims and ordinance committee, in terms of responding to requests for opinions uh, when the city council president brings them forward, uh, that's always going to be part of the city solicitor's role. Um, so I, it's not explicitly in there, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's inferred that it's, uh, that it's representing the entire city of Northampton. Um, sure, yes. Specific to this yeah. question. I have similar concerns, I think, to Councillor Adams, because I think if we're, uh, you know, the, one of the, the central purposes of the new charter was to really create that separation between the executive branch and the legislative branch, the council and the mayor. Mm -hmm. And if, um, if, in fact, we're looking for checks and balances by doing that, if we have one city solicitor who's supposed to represent the mayor's interests as well as the city council's interests, if we have a difference of opinion about something, you know, what do we then do? Because we have one city solicitor who serves both of us, um, and that person is necessarily going yeah. to have to divide his quote unquote loyalty. I think the difference there is that the city solicitor um, is supposed to represent the city of Northampton, not, not, you know, um, not you know, political views of one body or another body or, you know, and I think that's one of the things I respect about Alan is that he always gives me just sort of the unvarnished legal opinion. And I think that's what he does in every case. So I, I really don't see it as, um, 
that that's part of that separation. I mean, the city solicitor, or, or so, as it's called, corporation council, is fairly well defined in terms of o the overall structure of the state. If you're a town, um, you you and you do a town meeting ordinance or something like that. You bring it to the AG's office; they'll do a consultation. If you're a city, the city solicitor is sort of the last word. Is sort of the legal the local legal authority on issues related to either ordinances or bylaws or ethics issues or things like that. You can always go to the state ethics commission, but so I just think it's a, di it's a, it's a different situation. Um, I, I really, you know, I know that that's been the implication um, that because someone doesn't agree with the opinion that the city solicitor has delivered, um, that somehow uh, that he's only providing legal advice to me and not to the city council. I just don't think that that's really borne out. I mean, there is a mechanism if you believe that the city solicitor is giving you is giving us incorrect advice. There's ways to to go to you know to try to pursue that further. I just um, the I yeah I, I just I, I'm not sure how um, you know the DPW director works for me. So when he comes before the city council, um, would you want your own public works expert who could? Uh, countervail or, or, or argue with the DPW director. I, mean, I think it's, it's just, it, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, Alan has been, has taken an oath, both as an attorney and he's taken an oath as a city solicitor to, per, to represent the legal interests of the city of Northampton. So um, that's kind of my take on it. And I thought in, in one of the things I was trying to do in this process, um, again, it's been the sole appointee of the mayor um, which I think may have contributed to that perception. So by making it an appointment that's subject to the confirmation of the city council, I was hoping in some ways to kind of dispel that appearance as well as just make it conform to the rest of the charter. So. I guess it just begs the question then whether or not the administrative order needs to have some sort of um, mention of the ability of the council to seek um, counsel, legal counsel for matters um, where there is a difference of opinion between the executive branch and the legislative branch. I mean, maybe this isn't the correct document for that, but I, I'm wondering if there doesn't, in fact, need to be something like that in writing. Hmm. Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I suppose, um, again, I think the council could um, sort of debate that internally and could could pose that as a budgetary item or something like that um, for itself um, and present it to the to the mayor and then the mayor would have to consider that um, in terms of putting together the budget um, again um, you know uh, knowing what our legal bills are I can't imagine the thought of paying legal bills to to city lawyers to go back and forth and argue with each other it just doesn't uh, make sense and actually if there really is, a, again, I, no one has shown me an issue where I believe where the city solicitor's advice has not been sound. I, I don't know. If there's a specific issue, I'd be willing to think about that or talk with you about that. I just don't know what that issue is. Council Spector, to this point? It is to this point. I mean, in the same way the, the mayor might disagree with the city solicitors, and then do we need some place where he can? I don't agree with that decision, so I need to come forward to. Uh, get the money to hire another attorney to get a, a, another opinion. And um, I guess the council is certainly could do that the same way the mayor could come forward and do that as well, correct? You could come forward and say, look, the city solicitor said X, Y, and Z, but I want to come forward and get a, a different legal opinion, and we could budget it or not budget. Is that possible? Uh, I mean, I'm not saying you not should. I, I don't really see that happening, frankly. Yeah. I, I, I just don't. I'm, just, I'm um, raising that because the yeah. council could do the same. I mean, we fre we frequently hire outside counsel, not because we disagree, not because with, you disagree, but because there may be some specialized area, environmental yep. law, you know, something like that. We may hire outside counsel, casino uh, negotiations, things like that. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't foresee that happening. But I suppose anything's possible. Councilor Klein, you still have the floor, and it actually, there was originally the floor was uh, Councilor Adams, but are you are you all set? Do you have more follow up? Or? No, I think I'm also thanks. Okay, and you, you wanted the floor on another point too? Yeah. Okay, so we'll go to Councilor Adams, who had the floor originally. Um, and Councilor Carney, did you want to speak to this point? No, 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 no I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I just want to say that um, 
there is a difference if the council disagrees with um, the city solicitor and if, for example, the BPW director disagree with the city solicitor because the, the council is the legislative branch of the city where the lawmaking arm of the government, if we did have a dif disagreement with the city solicitor in an issue where the city solicitor was siding with the mayor and I've been in that position on an ordinance and a, a serious matter, um, the legislative branch and that the legislator or legislators are left without counsel in that situation. And in that situation, the lawmaking branch of the city being left without counsel, I think, is problematic. So if that happens in the future, I think we do need to consider if in those limited situations there should be additional legal counsel because certainly we don't want to add to that legal counsel budget, but at the same time, we may there may be situations where it may make sense depending on the magnitude of the issue at hand. No, and, and I, the only thing I would say to that is that if there, you know, if if you had if you did have legal counsel and uh, and there was a disagreement with the city solicitor, the only place it would be resolved would be in court. I mean, that would be the and and so I think if there was that type of a serious issue that the city council uh, really felt challenge some ruling of the city solicitor, uh, I think I would, you know, probably, uh, I guess I, I, mean, I guess it would be my obligation to fund your legal uh, fees for that if the council really felt compelled. I can say there's a lot of case law around this. Um, uh, the, city solic the city council of Boston has been suing the mayor of Boston for centuries, uh, um, hasn't, doesn't have a very winning record. Um, but but there have been cases where there are there are cases mayor versus city council um, or you know mayor of Boston versus the city council of Boston uh, so that it is theoretically possible to go to court on an issue like that so um, I hope we don't reach that point but um, but certainly if it did reach that point uh, we'd have to we'd have to talk about that there is precedent in the city as well uh, council the barge uh, sued. Uh, Hey, not me. That was Ray. Uh, Councilman <laughs> LaBarge sued um, Mayor Higgins and, and lost. And Mayor Higgins and the city was rep were represented by Alan Seawall. Yeah. Um, Councilor Adams, any more questions on? Or? I have one very small question. Okay. About the Central Services actually brought this up when we met. I just noticed that um, under its authorities and responsibilities, it says that it's responsible for the care and maintenance of all municipal property. And that sounds like all property, including roads, but I, I've always been under the impression that the highway department would have that authority. So yeah, I, 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 think, when you, I think you thought it pertained to real property, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, when we're talking about central services, we're talking about the facilities um, and, and property associated within. I think that's the reference there. Also, I think if you do look at the... Um, you know, if you do look at the, um, uh, you know, if you do look at the, at the at the Department of Public Works, it's responsible for design, engineering, maintenance, and repair of all public works infrastructure. Um, that's clearly delineated in the public works. So I think even if there's any doubt about that somehow the central services is responsible for roads, I think it would be cleared up if you read the DPW description, which says infrastructure. So. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's the difference there. And actually, I think we pulled that from the ordinance. Um, and in fact, oddly, the central services is responsible for the DPW <coughs> facility itself. Um, they're not, you know, they, that's one of the facilities that the central services maintains, or one of the city properties it maintains. But I think uh, we 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 are we are trying to draw a distinction. And I think if you look at the two together, I think it makes that distinction. Councilor Klein, you, you're up now. Well, I have um, one quick procedural question, and then I have something a little bit more um, substantial. Um, so I understand the council can't amend anything here. So I'm wondering if there's any way in which this doesn't have to be a zero-sum game, and um, if there's a possibility that you would consider you would go back and um, retool any pieces based on the comments that have come in from the public and the council during these two hearings? 
I think um, my preference would be to um, that the order would stand as it is. Um, I, I, I certainly I appreciate the comments. I, I hear the comments. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I don't. I think if five different, ten different people wrote this order, it would be ten different orders. I think the fundamental structure is there, and I think again, it's a living document. So, and I, I think I said this about the Public Shade Tree Commission. We're, we're forming this new commission with a new role, a new relationship with directly with the tree warden. They can go off. Um, and they may come forward in six months and say, you know what, we want to, we would like to recommend this change to our charge, to our structure, et cetera. And that would be an order that I would put forward on its own to the city council. Um, I just, I, yeah, I, I guess I feel like given that this is the first and we're pulling all these disparate uh, sources from the charter, from the ordinances, from state law, um, yeah, that my preference would be to have this code adopted and then work with counselors or work with boards about uh, changes to it. And then uh, just the last thing I wanted to ask you about is I um, looked through all of the um, descriptions of departments and looked uh, to see if you talked about uh, pesticides anywhere and just I looked under sustainability and public health, the Board of Health, um, and nowhere is there any mention of that as a topic that needs to be kind of um, head-on addressed in the city. And I'm wondering, you know, where you see that falling and, and why it's not one of the named um, arenas in which any committees or departments need to work. Yeah, I, I, again, I think um, it's a 25-page it's a document as it is, and we were really working hard to keep these descriptions very concise, to take out, uh, you know, to not go into long descriptions or lists of the kinds of things. You know, you probably won't find, uh, you, know, uh, you know, underage drinking or tobacco or, or any of the other public health kinds of issues or Ebola, I, that probably was predated this, but um, or flu, or you know, there's we didn't list out every single item that a department would be working on. We very consciously tried to keep it as broad as possible. So yeah, there is no mention of that in there, um, but clearly that's one of the issues that we're that we're working on, um, including you know, I think I mentioned this to you the other day, but today I was at a press conference in Springfield with the. Um, the mayor of Springfield and the director of their Parks and Rec Department. And we've received a grant from the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. Uh, they have a toxic, uh, util uh, toxic Reduction Institute, Tory, um, and uh, they've awarded a grant to the city of Springfield, working collaboratively with Northampton and Holyoke uh, to do training around pesticide reduction of all of our staffs um, and to develop to really further refine and develop organic approaches to land management and park management, et cetera. <clears throat> so we're, we're committed to that. And obviously, we are moving forward with the Florence Fields, um, uh, moving that to an organic uh, management policy. So um, again, there are lots of things. Uh, we don't, I don't think you'll find the word um, solar in this document anywhere. But we're very committed to that and, and looking at, you know, renewables and things like that. So it's just, it really was about an economy of words and trying to keep it as concise as possible. Any other questions, comments? We're actually coming up against 9 o'clock, which is the deadline for this, this hearing. Um, move, no, move to close the public hearing. Second. Second. Motions are made and seconded to close the hearing. All those in favor of closing, please say aye. Aye. Thank all of you for participating, watching, and paying attention to this. Yep. And, uh, I'm grateful for your time and, and <coughs> applause to my colleague. Have a good night. <laughs>